so slow. Well, good morning. He is risen. Yes. If you did not grow up in church culture, that's totally fine. But if you did, then you'd not recognize that little call and response. He is risen, echoing. He is risen indeed. Let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Well, we are here on Resurrection Sunday. As we gather in this place, we are so excited that you're here with us. We are here to celebrate, to honor, to remember Jesus' victory over death and all that that means for us. So welcome as we celebrate, as we join in this place together. Man, we're so excited for you. we got some things for you today, some surprises, some things. Kids, we are loving that you're in the room with us. We've got some stuff for you as well. Hopefully when you came in, uh, there were some, uh, I don't know what we want to call those kind of... There's little bags uh, for the kids out there in the welcome area. If you didn't get one, make sure to go get one. And uh, those are some things in there to help keep you busy and occupied during our time together as well. So, um, man, let's celebrate together. Let me just pray as we begin our time. God, thank you for the celebration that we are starting right now. God, thank you for the, the great reminder of your victory over death and all that it means for us. And so, God, today as we lift our voices, as we share in the scriptures, as we Remember your body and blood as we pray for one another. God, as we do all of these things, we're asking, God, that you would bless us and you would meet us right here. God, have your way with us during this time. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, this week I, I was reading through the Gospels, kind of the, the final week um, leading up to uh, Good Friday and, and today, Resurrection Sunday. Um, and one of the... One of the um, appearances after the resurrection kind of stood out to me a little bit in a different way than it had before and it's when Jesus appears in the upper room when all of the disciples are gathered um, and he was trying to show himself and, and like let them believe that it was really him and uh, he said see my my scars on my hands and my feet and and the the verse that stood out um, was um, Luke 24, uh, verse 41, and it says, while they still disbelieved, disbelieved for joy and were marveling. And why does this matter so much? Uh, why did Luke include that? Um, first, even after everything that happened, the disciples did not believe their eyes. Uh, even after... Jesus predicted his death and resurrection three times. After they witnessed him raising Lazarus and the power that came from, from the words that he spoke. Um, even after others had encountered Jesus post-resurrection, there he was in front of them, and yet they still disbelieved. Why? Because in our human understanding, death is final. So even when a resurrected life is standing in front of them, they have a hard time believing it. But there's a second reason that this phrase is so significant. Even in their disbelief, they still experienced joy. Disbelief and doubt do not have to be a limit on our faith. We see the disciples startled, frightened, disbelieving, wondering, and joyful. So when we, like the disciples, feel discouraged, grieving, or doubting, uh, there's a hope that joy is still possible. Uh, joy is not a result of knowledge and certainty. Even when the disciples doubted, they still had joy. Uh, I said this last week, joy is a gladness not based on circumstance. Joy is the outpouring of hope. And in Hebrews, it says, we have this sure and steadfast hope as an anchor for the soul that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever. And that's what we're here to celebrate today, church, uh, is the resurrected Jesus, our high priest, um, 
and the one who gives us our eternal hope. So would you stand with us and sing with us?
taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing. But this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a Resurrection means our rise. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory.
seated we're going to enter into a time of communion and it, as we're coming to this time if you did not get a chance to grab that those are found on the back corners here in the metal baskets and so if you didn't get a chance to grab that you can do that send somebody from your family go grab some for everyone as we get ready See if I can remember to bend over. <laughs> That's loud. I 
I lost a pair of glasses that I had in the yard somewhere, so I might not look up as often um, as what I used to, because when I look up with these, everything's blurry, but I can read just real good with them. Uh, I was thinking for the last three weeks, I knew I had uh, the communion preparation on Sunday, Easter Sunday, and uh, I changed my mind so many times. Uh, I thought it had to be just right, had to be so special, and I I was overdoing it. I wasn't letting the Lord take over. Um, and then a friend of mine, a good old friend of mine, uh, dear to my heart, he reminded me, he used to have a saying that he used, but usually applies to me. He said, uh, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> With that said, uh, I asked the Lord to help my heart when I get up here. It's special to me because he's special to me. A few months back, we celebrated the miracle of our Savior's birth from the Virgin Mary, which was foretold hundreds of years before it in the Old Testament. And everything about that birth and the rest of his life on earth was humble. His first bed was a feed trough in the stable. As he grew, he learned a humble trade, carpenter, which might have involved more stonework than woodwork. And then later he read and knew the scriptures. And then eventually thousands were saved through Jesus' teaching and healing miracles. He did it in such a different way than the Pharisees. All this was foretold in the Old Testament too, hundreds of years before. Then comes the part where he prepares his disciples for his death another period of his life that was getting close. His death on the cross to take our place, pay for our sins, also foretold in the Old Testament. His life on earth was spent serving instead of being served. He did this for every person, Jews, Gentiles alike. He hadn't come to reign just yet. He came to prepare for his reign. To give us and others a chance to be with him forever. Now Easter is my favorite holiday. We serve a risen Savior. That's special. And until he comes to get us, when he comes back again, he, want, he wants us to share what we found in him. Salvation that saved us for eternity. We can't be selfish with that gift. It's important that we share that. And that was the Great Commission. That's what he wanted us to do. He also, oops, that was long. He also wanted us to have communion together as his church. He's gone ahead to prepare a place for us while we do what, we're, what he wants us to do here in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's telling of Jesus. Uh, Jesus wanted a special time with the disciples before he died. Um, it was important to him because his time was getting so close and the disciples and him were so close. It says in Luke chapter 22, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Before we uh, partake of the, the communion, um, I know I need to spend some quiet time with my father and my Jesus. Just since last week when I took communion, I haven't lived a perfect life. There's anger issues. Are too many distractions on the TV. Um, we should focus. But let's spend a minute together with the Lord and examine ourselves and ask him to, to write our heart before we partake of the elements. And then I'll pray before we take them. <coughs>
Father, we thank you so much. And those words just don't seem enough sometimes for doing what you did on the cross, taking our sin on you. You can think about it a long time and think just mere words aren't enough to thank you for what you've done. But it is a perfect gift according to God's will, I guess. But it makes me sad when I, on Good Friday. It was a sad day, an emotional day. But today, on Easter, thank you so much, Jesus. We love you. Thank you in your name. Amen. After taking the cup, you give thanks and said... <clears throat> Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. He took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Well, good morning great time so far. Hey, as we get ready for a couple things, I uh, want to just point your attention to uh, the bulletin as you came in. Hopefully you grabbed one of those. Just gives you uh, insight on a few things that are happening in and around the church in the weeks to come. Uh, so I just want to hit a couple of those. Uh, first, next week, uh, if you come back to join us, uh, we do a rather unique uh, kind of service that we've been doing uh, for a little while. Uh, this will be the last one, just as a reminder, um, for the rest of the summer, and that's where we do kind of a table gathering as part of our worship, uh, where we'll actually be in the gym sharing a meal together as, as we sing and celebrate and study and interact with one another. We include a meal as part of that, and we'd love to have you come back for that uh, next week. Again, that'll be the last one for the rest of the summer because we've got other activities and things being planned for the rest of the summer. <clears throat> um, also, uh, want to just uh, make you aware Coming up here in a couple weeks are the uh, an opportunity to pray together as a church with some of the elders. We gather here um, on the 17th, I believe, is the date that it's going to be. Yep, April 17th. Here at 6 o'clock at the church, we'd love for you to gather with us and pray for the needs of the body and the church and all those kind of things. A couple other things. To, uh, kids, ministry stuff today after service, like Pulse usually meets, they're not meeting. Speaking of kids, welcome to the room. If you came in late and you didn't get a chance to grab a, a goodie bag, a Jen has those in the back of the room, and she'd love to give you one of those if you would like one of those. Just some activities and things for you to do today during our time together. Um, also, uh, if you've been around Northwest for the last uh, few weeks, we're doing a t-shirt sale. If you're interested in picking one of those up, see uh, me or Shereen after service, and we can kind of give you some information about that. This is the last Sunday we place those orders today, so uh, last chance for that. Um, last thing, uh, if you're newer to Northwest, one of the uh, ministry things that we do is Jen does uh, called the Green Room Club. And Green Room Club is... Um, our preteens, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, meet once a month, and one of the things that they love doing is filming themselves doing a Bible story, a Bible lesson of some kind, and then sharing that with us. We thought we'd love to share their latest with you today. So are you up for a green room club, kids in the room? If you're in it, welcome. You guys get to see this for the first time. If you are of that age and you are not been a part of that, we'd love for you to be a part of it. Third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Sorry, Jen was correcting me. Um, so we'd love to have you guys be a part of that. So without further ado, our latest Green Room Club.
Ha, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Green Room Club. You guys are amazing. Uh, we love our kids here at Northwest, and uh, if you've got them, we love them. And if they're in this room and they're getting squirrely and making noise, it's okay. You will be more frustrated by it than we will, and that's our, like, we're good. We're, we love our kids. We know they make noises. We know they get squirrely. Some of them are better behaved than some of you adults, okay? So putting that out there as well. Um, let me pray, and then we're going to jump into uh, some study. God, thank you for our time together today. Pray, God, that our time would be beneficial. So, uh, Spirit, meet us right here. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Day. Man, it's a great day. It's a phenomenal day. It's a wonderful day. You're not nearly as excited as you ought to be about today, right? Like, it is an amazing day. Now, some of you might be wondering, okay, well, why is it such a great day? Well, let me tell you. I'm excited to tell you why we as followers and disciples of Jesus are so excited about today. See, Jesus is our hero. He is our hope. He is our treasure he is our Savior, and we celebrate him today. Now, in truth, we celebrate him every day as followers of him, but today especially, because something rather unexpected happened on this day many, many years ago, and it's what we're remembering. And speaking of unexpected, um, unexpected things, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? Like, unexpected things can be amazing, right? Those surprises that we get, like, 
hey, kids, I remember we went on vacation one year with our kids, and we did not tell them where we were going, when we were going, what we were doing. Um, one of my boys, Austin, loved it. One of my boys, Aiden, hated it. He's not into these kind of surprises, wants to know the itinerary, the plan, all of it, right? We said, surprise, we're going on vacation. Just woke him up, your bags are packed, right? It was a great surprise. Everyone loved it, minus Aiden. Um, but other than that, like, it was a wonderful surprise. We love surprises like that. Some surprises, like, they make us feel good. They're fun. They're funny. Like, who doesn't love a good America's Funniest Home Videos? Like, they're just amazing, the twists and turns that those videos take. But other surprises, not so much. Like when you're driving along, rocking to your favorite song, and then all of a sudden those flashy lights behind you show up, like that is not a welcome surprise. That was rather unexpected while I was singing Journey to the highest volumes in my car possibly, right? We'll pray for you who are singing country music. We'll pray for you today, don't worry. Um, or, or like when, when an unexpected charge shows up on, on a bill and you're like, uh, that is not supposed to be here. Where did this come from, right? Those are unexpected in the worst ways. I want to just kind of think about unexpected things today. As we do, uh, kids, a uh, little game for you up on the screen. I know it's a little bit far away, but you've got better eyes than us old people, so you're going to be fine. Um, but uh, kids, there are some unexpected changes between the top picture and this bottom picture. See if you can find them. Do you want to know how many changes there are? I, do you want to know? I'll tell you up front if you want to know how many. There's nine. See if you can find all nine by the end of the service. Grown-ups, we know that you're welcome to play along as well, okay? Uh, but don't help them. Let them do it themselves. All right. Kids, if you feel like you need to come up closer, it will not bother me at all. Check with your parents if you want to come up here in the front and look from a little bit closer, okay? That being said, um, unexpected things. So why do we celebrate? Why are we as Christians, we celebrating today? The reason begins with this. Jesus died. Now that kind of seems like a bummer. Right? Like, like that is the unexpected answer to why the celebration, why the hype, why all of the excitement? Oh, well, because Jesus died. You're like, what? In order for that part to make sense, I've got to back up. So let me back up a little bit to explain. See, God, creator of everything, created. And in his creation, he created everything good, including humanity. Now, this is going to be the like, broadest summation kind of I can in the totality of the biblical story. So bear with me if I don't go into greater detail in some areas as you might want. But God created, and he makes all things good. And this design for creation was that creator and creation would live together in perfect unity and love. And he gave humanity this wonderful gift of choice, freedom to choose to love God in return, to welcome into this beautiful relationship. But what came along with this free choice was the ability to choose not to follow God, to trust him and to love him. And as the story goes, that's exactly what humanity chose. They chose their own way rather than God. And the problem is, that this resulted in some terrible things. Mainly, the scriptures kind of sum it all up by calling it death. Death, this, this separation, this broken relationship. It, it, it created death within relationships. Death between uh, creation itself and humanity. A separation from God and humans. And ultimately, an end of our physical life. God explains to humanity this tragedy that befalls them because of their rebellion. And everything became messed up. Everything in our world began to be broken and marred. Like I said, relationships, trust, and union, plants, animals, even life itself, all of it comes to death. Death of everything. Sin brought death. Now, now, here's the good news. God, because he's God, and because he's got this eternal perspective, he sees all, knows all, and knew that our free choices would actually end up resulting in us making a mess of everything. 
So Paul, one of the writers of the Bible, says that God, before the foundations of the world, before everything was created, had this plan that he was going to save us from the mess that we would make. So how? How did he do that? Well, this is the story of the Bible. As you read through the books of the Bible, you're reading the story of God's plan of salvation because of man's folly. God's plan is that he would bring salvation to the world by working in the midst of a really messed up humanity. He, he makes a covenant, an unbreakable bond with a people. And I would love to tell you that that worked, but it didn't. See, they were meant to obey him and trust him and live out for all of the world to see a way of living in unity with God. And as humans, as, as outsiders saw this group of people living this way in union and, and, and love with God, that they would want to join in and, and become a part of this and enter into relationship as well. But it didn't go that way. See, this group of people is known as the nation of Israel in the scriptures. And their story throughout is one told throughout the Old Testament, but it is one fraught with more and more rebellion and stress and brokenness. But we know from the scriptures that it didn't go well, but God knew that. And what is unpacked then in the scriptures is God knew the entire time that there was more to unfold in his story of redemption. That as time goes on, he said at just the right time, one was coming. And then see, we go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, and we read how God even then, at the, at the mark, at the start of this sin and death and rebellion, God made a promise that one would come to ultimately deal with sin. And his name is Jesus. See, Jesus is God become a man. Jesus is the perfect representation of God on earth. The scriptures reveal this, this mystery that God exists as one being in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And it makes our brains hurt to kind of think about it. And we try our best to, to reason these things through and make sense of it all. But we are confident through the scriptures that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Son comes to earth. He comes as God on earth. This is what we celebrate every year at Christmas. That God became a man. Now in doing this, God did something remarkable. He set aside some of the divine attributes that are so do him, but he humbles himself and is willing to live in flesh. I mean, this blows my mind to think about, that God humbled, it, like all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal God humbles himself to the place where he is going to be born of a woman. And you think about a baby and how needy they are, right? All-powerful God is, can't even lift his head, right? The bobblehead that is a newborn baby, right? That's Jesus. All-powerful creator breathes life into everything, can't hold up his head straight. This is Jesus who has to do the toddler walk, learning what gravity and steadiness, all of these things are. This is God creator of all humanity, having to learn language and speak, God humbles himself and becomes like us. It's amazing. And in his life, Jesus continually, we read these in the scriptures, he kept telling people, hey, I'm God. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm here. And people were like, mm, maybe, I don't know, possibly, probably not. And others were, yes, you are. And not only did he say clearly, I'm God, I'm Messiah, I'm here, but then he went on and proved it. How did he prove it? Through miracles. He healed people. He taught people in ways that they were marveled at. He knew things that only God could know. He even raised people from the dead. And what's amazing about the life of Jesus is we see lived out in Jesus' life the very thing that the nation of Israel was meant to be. 
people from all over the place coming and being drawn to the nation of Israel. That was the plan. And what do we see in Jesus? People of every background and tribe and tongue. It didn't matter, Jew or Gentile. They would come. I need to know Jesus. Rich and poor, young and old, male, female. It didn't matter. Jesus drew crowds from everyone. This is what the nation of Israel was meant to be. This was the plan of God. And through it, people kept seeing Jesus powerful over everything. Well, this naturally drew the attention of the religious leaders of that day who, who thought their perspective and tradition and their own positions of power were more important than listening to this troublemaker, Jesus. So they set in motion a plan to get rid of Jesus by killing him. This is what we remember every Good Friday. And just this last Friday, we took some time remembering some of the gruesome details of that moment. And we left some of those stations up in the back of the room, and you're welcome to visit those on your way out and remember these things. But we, we took time to remember the whip that ripped Jesus' flesh open, the crown of thorns that was placed on his head, mocking him, the sponge of vinegar that was given to him to drink, the nails that were driven into his hands and feet, the sign placed above him that read Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, mocking him. And a spear that was ultimately thrust into his side, sh making sure that he was indeed dead. Like, why do we remember that? Why do we call this Good Friday? And why do we purpose ourselves in remembering this tragedy? Because Jesus never sinned. And Jesus is God become a man. And he allowed himself to be subject to death. Even though he did not deserve it, he did not earn it, but he allowed himself to be killed in perhaps the most brutal death imaginable. The biblical authors tell us that Jesus served as a sacrifice for us. That, that all of the sacrifices throughout the nation of Israel's past, they were meant to prepare us for the ultimate final sacrifice. Jesus was that sacrifice. Jesus paid the price for sin, even though he had never sinned. And this is what Jesus says about himself in anticipation of this sacrifice. He says, perhaps some of the most famous biblical verses in the Bible, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, but why should we believe Jesus and this claim? Okay, if we trust in you, if we believe in you, we don't have to experience death. We can experience life because you came to save us, not condemn us. Okay, Jesus, why should we believe you? Because he rose from the dead. If not for that, sure, he was a good teacher. We've got lots of good teachers in this world. He was a great example. Man, we have lots of great examples. He did some really cool things like miracles. We, we've seen miracles. People have said that they've created miracles. We, all of these things, right? Raising from the dead is the one unique thing that nobody has done. Jesus raised from the dead. Three days later, he rose. This is unlike anyone else and why Jesus has our attention. Not only did you claim to be God, but you proved it through all of these things, and then you rose from the dead because death could not hold you because you had no sin. Amazing. Amazing. So, he rises from the dead, and here's what happens next. Luke chapter, chapter 24 Verse 1, this is the account from Luke on the resurrection. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Backstory, some of the ladies at this time, the way that you would prepare a body for embalming is you would place them into a tomb, rock cut out of a rock, stone rolled in front of it, but inside this, there would be a sarcophagus of sorts, this place where you would place the body. You'd wrap it in linens, layer it with some spices that would help the decomposition process and over the course of a year that would happen and then after a year you would move the body to a different place usually further deeper into the cave 
So the body is placed in the tomb. It's Passover, so you don't do all of the preparation. You've got to rest on that day. So the ladies are coming back after Passover, after, uh, um, I lost the word, uh, Sabbath, thank you, um, to rest. They come back, and they're now going to finish the process of preparing Jesus' body. And they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men standing by them in dazzling apparel. I love that. As they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. Rise. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb. They, had, uh, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Amazing, brilliant, and totally unexpected in every way for these women. Everything about the resurrection is unexpected in every way. They went expecting him to be in the tomb. He's not there. They went expecting to find guards. Not there. They're met with angels. They're expecting sorrow, and their hearts are filled with gladness in spite of the confusion, as Christy talked about a few minutes ago. Everything about this is unexpected. But what's crazy is the angels tell these women, why are you so surprised? Didn't Jesus tell you this is exactly what was going to happen? Like, he's been saying this for a while. Like, I'm going to be handed over, going to be arrested, going to be killed. No worries. Three days later, I will rise. And they went, okay, cool. We don't understand. And then that's exactly what happened. They were shocked by all of this, even though Jesus had prepared them for it. Now, here's what I find also unexpected about the entire resurrection story that we just read. If you and I, let's just say you're Jesus right? And you were going to resurrect from the dead. How might you do it? For me, it would be with trumpet and fanfare, laser light show, balloons and confetti. Like, it would be a spectacle to behold. Look at me. Look at the power over sin. Baby, I'm back, right? It's like that kind of moment. How does Jesus do it? Early in the morning before anybody's awake. No witnesses. Quiet. Humble. Totally unexpected for what we would think. You're conquering Satan's sin and death in this moment, and it's and it comes with with silence. Massively unexpected. And not only that, as the story continues, what Jesus does is completely unexpected. Again, I'm picturing parades and fanfare as he marches through. Ha, I told you, right? None of that. No, it's quietly, secretly making himself visible to people. He appears. He appears to the disciples in a room closed off when Thomas isn't there. And then later on when Thomas is there. He shows up on the road to Emmaus, as Luke tells us about. He shows up on the Sea of Galilee. Paul then says that at one point he shows himself to upwards of 500 people as he's talking and sharing with them over the course of these 40 days. He keeps showing up, but it's not in ways that you and I would anticipate. It's, it, it's low-key. It's not with great fanfare. And here's what I keep thinking about. Here's what's got me thinking about this unexpected nature of Jesus. This is exactly what his whole life was. It was Jesus doing the unexpected and showing up in the most unexpected places. Like if you're familiar with the Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as they unpack Jesus' life, Jesus keeps showing up in places that are unexpected. Like Bethlehem. He's born in this tiny little town of Bethlehem. You would think God, king of the universe, if he were to be born, you would think a palace. You would think high and lifted up. Everybody knows. No, it's quiet. Surrounded by shepherds. He's born 
in Bethlehem, but his family's from Nazareth. He goes back to Nazareth. This is where he lives and grows up. What's so, so what's the big deal about Nazareth? Here's Nazareth. As he starts calling people to follow him, Nathaniel, one of the guys, he goes, you're telling me Messiah is from Nazareth? And he says, quote, could anything good come from Nazareth? It, it's like Ida. Could anything good, I'm just kidding, I'm just teasing, right? I, in my mind, I went, eerie, Ida, which should I go, right? It's like that, like, could anything, what, this small little nothing of a, like, what? Does anything good, could anything massive, anything important ever come from this small little, like, that's, that's Nazareth. That's unexpected in every way. Jesus then begins calling people to follow him. You would expect the rich, the righteous, the noble, right? No, they're fishermen, they're rejects, they're a religious zealot and a tax collector. Jesus over and over calling the unexpected to come follow him. Then through his life, he drives people crazy with all of the unexpected things. You would think, here's God telling the world about how to be followers of God, how to walk in righteousness, so where would he go? Among those who've got their lives together. Yes, come, follow me. Yes, welcome. No, no, no. He finds himself surrounded all the time by sinners, by the lowly, by the marginalized. One, one thing that we at Northwest, we, we found captivating this last year, was how often Jesus found himself at dinner parties at sinners' houses. People rejected by the world were like, hey, would you just come over and have dinner with us? And Absolutely, let's go. And there'd be prostitutes and rejects and sinners and tax collectors there, and it drove the religious leaders mad. This is unexpected. This is not what we thought. Jesus' life was not one of being rich but poor over and over and over. Unexpected. Healing people, raising people from the dead. And he didn't, all kinds of things, right? We could go on and on. Just read through the Gospels. You'll be shocked by the things that Jesus did, the unexpected places he shows up. Kids, how are you doing at your picture find? Did you find them all? I'll give you the answers. The next screen has the answers for you. They're all circled. See if you found them all. As we wrap up today, let me, let me say this about this idea of being unexpected. Jesus is still showing up in unexpected places, in unexpected ways. After raising from the dead, Jesus and his disciples, they go out. And Jesus tells them to go into the world and continue doing this work. How? Jesus leaves, but he sends the Holy Spirit to empower them to walk as he did. So here today... Here's what I find amazing. Like I said, he's still showing up in unexpected places. You know, perhaps as I think about it, the most unexpected place Jesus would show up is in a church. Because <laughs> aren't we just a mess of a people? Like we gather here in this place and we're all, let's just be honest, we're a mess. Right? We're a mess. We're hypocrites. We're liars. We're sinners. Like We don't get it right most of the time. And yet, God in his great wisdom and grace says, no, no, no I'm willing to meet with you because I'm forgiving you through Jesus. I've empowered you and I'm calling you to live differently. I'm actually going to empower you to live differently. And yet, here we are, all different walks of life, young, old, rich, poor, and Jesus shows up in places like this. But it gets even stranger than that. Because Jesus can show up in your messed up family. And some of you have really messed up families. Right? And yet God keeps showing up there. God has a way of showing up in schools that only seek to reject him. God has a way of, of making himself known in nations that, that desire to force him out. Jesus keeps showing up in the menial tasks of life. God shows up in the most unexpected moments of our life. And the question is, are we willing and able to see him? Are we expecting him to show up in the unexpected? See, sometimes it's easy just to think about those things outside of ourselves. You're like, God wouldn't show up at a bar. Don't be so surprised. He might. 
But even more shocking than that are the moments in our own lives where we're not expecting him. Like, how about in those painful moments of life? You ever consider the fact that Jesus might be willing to meet you in the unexpected places of pain in your life? Or that Jesus might be willing to meet you right there in the midst of your addiction? Or that perhaps Jesus might be found right there in the midst of mourning or confusion or brokenness? Like right there in the moments of of a relational breakdown of marriage. That maybe even in those most unexpected places, Jesus might be found right there being willing to offer life and not death if we would choose to see him and obey him and trust him through it all. See, sometimes we fall into the same trap the religious leaders found themselves in. They expected Jesus to be something that he wasn't. But what he was was so much better. He is God become a man. And he's willing to meet you and I in the everyday moments of life. And they are often the most unexpected. So here's what I want to encourage you with today. As the worship team comes up, Jesus shows up all the time in all kinds of places. Will you, will we see him? Will we see him in the midst of the most broken moments of our life? And are we willing to even invite people in some of their most broken moments of life to see him in those? We've got a really unique way for you to remember this and maybe just spark this today. While we were in here, I have some helpers working out in the lobbies and in the gym area. Um, There are some 300 mini Jesuses hidden all over the place. He's just everywhere. He's in places you might, you might be uncomfortable finding him there in the bathroom. My guess is he's there. He's hidden, sometimes in plain sight. But on your way out, would you do me this favor? Would you all commit to just finding two or three? Leave them for the kids first, two or three, right? And then would you do this? Would you maybe hide one for yourself to see? Maybe that's in your car, maybe that's on your desk, maybe that's next to the TV, wherever wherever it is where where you're going to see him periodically. And just be reminded that Jesus shows up in unexpected places. Now, here's the fun. The other one, go hide that in Toledo or Temperance somewhere. I don't care. Put it in a restaurant, put it on a shelf, put it on a sign, like hide him somewhere so somewhere, somebody's going to say, there's a little Jesus here. How did he get here? What's he doing here? This is is not where Jesus should be, and maybe it just might be this moment of remembrance or or understanding for somebody that, that Jesus actually can be found in the most unexpected places, and perhaps that's the most expected place we would find him. Now, for some of you, you come in here and all of this has been a beautiful reminder of who Jesus is and a celebration. For others of you, I'll say this. You're like, Jesus who? (laughs) Welcome. We're really excited about him. And here's what I would invite you. If God has done a work in your heart here at all today, we would love to talk to you more about what it means to truly trust your life to Jesus. To what it means to to live as he is Lord and King of our lives. To trust him with every step of this life and all eternity. The the beautiful story is that, that you're a sinner. We all are. We're a mess. And we need saving. And Jesus is that Savior. And so he invites you to trust him, to love him, to walk with him. And we would so love to talk with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to confess him as Lord, to humble ourselves, to to repent, to turn away from sin and to walk with God. We'd love to talk with you about baptism and what it means to identify with Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. We'd love to encourage you with the great news that this life is not all there is. We have eternity on the horizon, and in Jesus, that is life eternal with him in glory. 
We'd love for you to know the peace that is Jesus, our Savior. Amen, Christians? We want you to know this. We want you to be free of the stain of sin and death and to walk in freedom. So as we wrap up this part, we're going to sing a couple more songs. We're going to sing a song, have a time of prayer, and then we'll sing one more song in closing our time together and then go find your mini Jesuses. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for our time together today. God, thank you for uh, a time of celebration, a time of levity and lightness, and also a time of maybe some heart reflection just for a moment. God, we know that as we are getting ready to leave this place in a few short minutes, there are parties and there are gatherings and there are meals to be had and, and joy to be shared. And God, we expectantly wait to see you in unexpected places. <laughs> we can't wait to see you in the moments where nobody's expecting you. God, make yourself known today in our own lives, in our own hearts, and in this world. God, thank you for this reminder today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.
Amen. You may be seated for a minute as we uh, enter into a time of prayer together.
As we conclude our time together, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more song. And as you're, again, a reminder on your way out, grab those mini Jesuses. They'll be in the lobby here in the two restrooms. They'll be in the two lobbies on this side in the classrooms and possible restrooms and then in the gym as well. So feel free to wander around. There is a spot in the gym for uh, taking some photographs on the uh, chalkboard in the back. Uh, so make sure to use that as well. Have a great day today, you guys. Joy. It is a gladness not rooted in circumstance. And people, we have joy because we have hope. And that hope is anchored on what happened this day thousands of years ago. Uh, Jesus raising from the dead was, is our hope for salvation, to live with him forevermore. And let's sing about that. I was there beneath my shame could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I met you. I was free.
Have a great day, you guys.